So I mentioned last week that what God gives us in the Ten Commandments, and we can all be very grateful for this, what God gives us in the Ten Commandments is a checklist on how to be perfect in just ten simple steps. I began the series last week by saying that if you are into to-do lists, this sermon series is for you because God speaks so clearly here, and He gives us a divine to-do list. He gives us a checklist of things that we must do if we ever hope to attain perfection. And so here in the Ten Commandments, he gives us this checklist, this checklist on how to be perfect. And it's really just ten simple, easy steps. You see, if we can just do these things perfectly, we can be perfect. But therein lies the problem. The problem that you and I face is that the Ten Commandments are too good for bad people like you and me. The Ten Commandments are not a description on how to be good. They are a demand that we be perfect. And as we know, the only thing that God accepts, the only thing that God approves of is perfection. We like to think that God accepts something smaller, our best efforts, our progress, however we define progress. But the fact of the matter is, and the Bible makes this clear, that the only thing God accepts, the only thing God approves is perfection. So if you are imperfect this morning, and you are incapable of keeping all of these things that God lays out in the Ten Commandments perfectly, infallibly, not just on the outside, but on the inside as well. Remember last week we talked about how God's law reaches down all the way inside of us, even to the level of motivation. It's not just that God requires we do everything right and perfectly on the outside. He demands that we want to do everything right and perfect on the inside all of the time. And so, the Ten Commandments really are, in a sense, a wall that God intends for us to crash into so that we can see how small, how weak, how incapable we are. That's the only way our eyes will ever be fixed on Jesus, the one who came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it for us. I was um, interviewed a while back. And I was asked a number of questions. This was a written interview, so they sent me a bunch of questions, and then I wrote my answers in, and then they published it. But this was one of the questions that was asked of me. In what ways is grace most commonly misunderstood today? It's a good question. It's a question that really is on the forefront of lots of people's minds. In what ways is grace misunderstood? In what ways do we typically abuse grace? In what ways is grace most misunderstood in our day and age? And this was my answer. I think the main way that grace is misunderstood today is when people confuse it with cheapened law. Think of Jesus' crushing line in the Sermon on the Mount. You therefore must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Grace, for many Christians, is the reduction of God's expectations of us. Because of grace, we think we just need to try hard. Grace becomes this law-cheapening agent attempting to make the law easier to follow. So, be perfect gets cheapened into do your best. Most people think that those who talk a lot about grace have a low view of God's law. For the theologically minded in the room, that's where people who are myopic in their focus on preaching grace often get charged with the heresy of antinomianism, which is a fancy word that Martin Luther coined, which means anti-law. And so most people think, um, most people think that those who talk a lot about grace have a low view of God's law. Other people think that those with a high view of God's law are the legalists. But it's actually a low view of the law that produces legalism, since a low view of the law causes us to conclude that we can do it, that the bar is low enough for us to jump over. 
A low view of the law makes us think that the standards are attainable, the goals are reachable, the demands are doable. This means that the biggest problem facing the church today, and you've heard me say this before, is not cheap grace, but cheap law. The idea that God accepts anything less than the perfection of Jesus. Only when we see that the way of God's law is absolutely inflexible will we see that God's grace is absolutely indispensable. A high view of the law reminds us that God accepts us on the basis of Christ's perfection, not our progress. Grace, properly understood, is the movement of a holy God toward an unholy people. He doesn't cheapen the law or ease its requirements. He fulfills them in his son who then gives us his righteousness. Okay, now, the reason I even bring that to your attention is because I want to warn you ahead of time that as we make our way through these commandments, we're not going to dumb down the law and make it a doable checklist on how to be good. That's cheapening the law. That's dumbing the law down. That's lowering the bar to such a degree that we begin to believe, actually, we can pull it off. We can do this. We're going to explore the highness of the law's demands and the ways that we fall short of each one, and then we're going to explore the beautiful ways that Jesus specifically met the demands on our behalf so that we can be free. We saw that last week, and I just mentioned it a minute ago. Jesus was charged with being, by the Pharisees, he was charged with being an antinomian, someone who was against the law, someone who was sweeping God's high demands under the rug. And Jesus, to counter that, said, I have not come to abolish the law. I mean, I've not come to abolish the law, I've actually come to fulfill the law what theologians refer to as Christ's active obedience, the very fact that he came to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law on our behalf because we failed at every point in keeping every jot and tittle of the law. Because the gospel is good news, and this is, this really is the heartbeat of the gospel. The gospel is the good news that the one who makes the demands also in Jesus meets the demands. That's glorious good news. It's news that you and I don't deserve to hear. That's the radicality of grace at work, that the one who makes these demands also meets these demands perfectly in the person of Jesus. So we're going to be making our way through each of these, and this week I want to look just at the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Now Martin Luther said that the first commandment is foundational. And the reason he said that is because failure to keep the first commandment is a failure to keep all the commandments because all of the other commandments are dependent on the first commandment. So, all of the other commandments that we read, commandment 2 through 10, are dependent on our keeping the first commandment. If we break the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. That is, in essence, breaking all the other commandments, because all the other commandments are dependent on the first one. Now, at first glance, it may seem like Christian people do okay with this one, you know? I mean, we get a little bit down the list, and we can see how, yeah, you know, I mean, I've broken this one, and... I've broken that one, but when it comes to the first one, we Christian people typically think we're doing okay with this one. After all, we're not atheists, you know? I mean, we believe in God. We're not agnostics. We believe in God. We believe that there's only one God, and uh, we believe that God is who He says He is, and He is real. He's not some fairy tale. Uh, We actually believe that God exists. We believe in Him. but. To read the commandment that way and to think that we're pulling it off simply because we believe there's a God and we aren't atheists or agnostics or something like that is a failure to understand what's actually going on here. You see, this commandment renders every single one of us guilty. Christian people, non-Christian people, inside the church people, outside the church people, religious people, non-religious people. A friend texted me last night and said, I've got an idea for you when it comes to preaching the first commandment. And I said, what is it? And so what he said, 
I'm going to help you with the first commandment. Read it and say, you have all failed this morning before you even got out of bed because everything in your life you have done to serve yourself in some way, then announce the gospel and serve communion. Okay, that was, that was the idea. Okay, this is, that, and I could have done that. Uh, maybe we should have done that, and the sermon would be over now, and we could celebrate communion together. But the fact of the matter is this, the first commandment is addressing idolatry. It's not first addressing atheism. It's not first addressing some agnostic worldview. It's addressing idolatry, and idolatry is not what you think it is. It's not what typically comes to your mind. It's not what typically comes to my mind. You think, you see, we, we think of idols, when we think of idols, we, we typically think of people who bow down to statues. You know, people in far off lands who, you know, make um, images that they bow down to, false gods, people in tribes in far off lands. But the Bible defines idolatry much deeper than that. In fact, the Bible defines idolatry much more broadly than that. The Bible defines idolatry as anything more important to you than God. Anything that your heart and your imagination absorb more than God. And what that means is that idols are not just bad things like a thirst for money or a thirst for power. Idols are not just bad things. They can actually also be good things like your kids. Getting good grades, a dream, an ambition, a good dream, a worthy ambition. Anything that we depend on that is smaller than God to invest our lives with ultimate meaning and value and worth and purpose and those sorts of things can be an idol. And so that means that idols are not just the bad things in our life, but idols can oftentimes be the good things in our our life. In fact, idols are oftentimes the good things in our life. Uh, our spouse, our children, our career, our, our vocation, our reputation, whatever the case may be, idols can typically be good things. They are good things. Um, I mean, an idol is something or someone that you trust in to save you. That's really the best definition of an idol that I can give you, that an idol is something or someone that you trust in to save you, which means that your relationships, your work, your reputation, all of these things can be idols, and we're going to look at that more specifically next week when we look at the second commandment. But what the first commandment addresses is the chief idol, the main idol, the idol that in a sense gives birth and life to all the other idols, and that's the idol of self. That's the idol that has been primary and premier since Genesis chapter 3. If you haven't visited our Liberate website, just liberate.org, you need to. There are lots and lots of amazing articles that are posted there every single week. There are videos. There are lots of things that you can go to to find resources, both theological, practical, biblical, on uh, the gospel and life and those sorts of things. But R.J. Grunewald wrote a piece at Liberate this past week called The Me Generation where he argued, because there are lots of people out there who say, well, this generation, you know, the selfie generation, the technological generation, the Facebook and Twitter generation, this is the premier me generation of all generations. And he actually argued pretty compellingly that every generation is the me generation, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And this is what he said, Adam and Eve, wanting to believe the serpent, said, not God, me. In every generation from the beginning of time, sin has caused the human heart to say, me, me, me. Ever since the Garden of Eden, ever since Genesis chapter 3, you see, we primarily rely on ourselves to save ourselves. It's our natural default mode. If we can just please the right people and make the right grades and marry the right person and raise successful children and establish the right reputation and secure the important spots and be a part of the right network and all of those things, we can be saved. We are addicted, as you've heard me say over and over and over again, to self-salvation projects going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. It goes all the way back, and it all goes back to the doctrine of justification by works. We tend to think that 
this doctrine, justification by works, is for people who believe that their good works can get God to love them. Their good works can get God to approve of them. And we say, we don't believe in that. We say, by grace, you are saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. We believe that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone. And so, um, you know, we, we're not guilty of believing in justification by works. But justification by works is not just a theological category and problem. It's a functional one. It's a, it's, a, it's a practical one. It's, it's something that we fall prey to each and every day, and this is what it is. I am what I do, and I am what I can become. I justify my existence by what I do. I validate myself by who I can become. And we give ourselves to this each and every day in a thousand different ways, and it makes life just remarkably heavy. And at first, this, this idea that we can be that we can save ourselves is, is appealing. You know, just as it was to Adam and Eve. Um, I mean, you can be like God. It seems promising. We all want to play the role of God, just like Jim Carrey and Bruce Almighty, which, by the way, is an amazing movie, okay? You can call it blasphemous if you want. I don't see it that way. The way I read that movie, and I, it's not theologically correct, okay? It's Hollywood. I'm not, it's not a theological textbook, that movie. But what's fascinating to me about that story, about that movie, is that, you know, Jim Carrey actually thinks that if he could simply become God, he could make his life better because his life was falling apart, and so he's charging God with injustice, and God says, would you like to take the reins? And he says, I'd love to. And at first, he's having a blast. You know, he's kind of giving everybody their wishes, and, you know, he's kind of, he's having a blast. He's blowing stuff up with his finger, and, you know, he, he parts his tomato soup in the diner like the Red Sea, and, you know, he's having a blast. But then he begins to realize that God's job is way too big for his small shoulders. And he actually, as a result of trying to be God, comes to the end of himself and gives the reins back to God. Um, you see, at first, this idea that we can save ourselves is promising, it's appealing. In some sense, it's, it's empowering. It's appealing just like it was to Adam and Eve, you can be like God, but you soon realize that trying to be God makes life heavy and hard. Being God is just too big of a job for all of us. No matter how hard we try, we can't control everything. We can't do everything. No matter how much effort we put forth, we are not one step closer to getting for ourselves the peace which transcends all understanding, the joy that only God can give, the satisfaction and the contentment that comes from God alone. See, Luther called this, Martin Luther called this posture, this way that we live trying to be God, the life of an unhappy God, which in some sense marks all of us. It's a life marked by fear. I better make it or else. I better accomplish this or else. I better become someone or else. My kids better turn out the way that I've always hoped and dreamed they'll turn out or else. It's a life that is marked by fear. Well, in contrast to a heavy, hard life marked by fear, by putting ourselves in the place of God, faith, on the other hand, is life under grace. Grace which says, it's not up to you. You can't make it happen no matter how hard you try. Someone from above the sun has to come and make it happen for you. You see, on the, on the cross, the seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent and by doing so demolished all notions that we can ever make ourselves right, save ourselves, or set ourselves free. So the gospel is good news for those who have crashed and burned under the weight of trying to rescue themselves. Because the the gospel is a declaration, a doxological declaration of good news that I don't need to save myself. 
I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to legitimize myself by what I do or who I can become or the people that I'm connected to or the way that I look or what people think of me. I don't need to justify myself. The gospel sets me free from the pressure to search high and low for happiness. The gospel announces that I am not on my own, that this is not on me that I am far smaller and far weaker than I think I am, but that Jesus is far bigger and far greater than I could ever hope for or imagine. You see, when faith in you turns to faith in God, life just becomes lighter. And you actually begin to live free because life ceases to be a tireless effort to prove yourself. And proving ourselves is a burden. I mean, justifying ourselves is a burden. Trying to make sure that all of our I's are dotted and T's are crossed is a burden. It makes life heavy. It makes life hard. And the gospel is the good news that Jesus has come to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And in that sense, he has come to set the captives free. And that means that real freedom in your life and mine, real freedom happens only when the resources of the gospel smash any sense of need to secure for myself anything beyond what Jesus has already secured for me. So we are perpetually guilty. We are inescapably guilty of the first commandment. We, I mean, we, we put ourselves before God naturally. This isn't something people have to teach us to do. This isn't something that our parents have to teach us to do or that society teaches us to do. Jesus made it very, very clear that what condemns us and enslaves us is not what's on the outside of us, it's what's on the inside of us. That's what makes life heavy, and that's what makes life hard. And real freedom happens only when the resources of the gospel, this idea that Jesus fulfilled the law on our behalf, he didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it, and that if we are in Christ, we live our lives under a banner that reads, it is finished. Real freedom only happens when the resources of the gospel smash, demolish any need, any sense of need to secure for myself anything beyond what Jesus has already secured for me. So, so far it's, I mean, I mean that's good news in a sense, but it's bad news. We're, we're guilty. Every single one of us is guilty. If you've been in church your entire life, you're guilty. If you can't remember the day God saved you because it happened at such an early age, and you think, I can't remember a day when God wasn't first in my life. Well, try today, okay? Like this morning. All right, last night when you went to bed, as you were dreaming, was God first in your dreams, okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. All of it, not some of it, not most of it, not just when you're in church singing songs, not just when you're listening to sermons or when you're driving in your car and listening to, you know, Christian music or whatever, you know, not just when you're praying at the dinner table, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, changing diapers, sweeping the floor, going to the office, sitting in long, laborious meetings, dealing with cantankerous people, bad drivers, you know, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all, all of it, not just, not just the appearance of it, like you're gritting your teeth and bearing it, and you're doing it on the outside, I'm going to give glory to God, I'm going to will myself to glorify God. There is not a person on this planet who is capable of willing themselves to glorify God. I mean, one of the, one of the biggest, um, delusions that we can suffer from is that we possess something called free will when it comes to God. Now, people get all up in arms about this because they go, well, I mean, I make choices every day. I'm free. I'm like, okay, they're not really, all right? I mean, you can say you're free to do whatever you please. You're free to choose whatever you want. But the fact of the matter is you have a makeup 
okay? I, I'm not free to choose to like baked potatoes. I've hated them from the time I can remember. I can't wake up tomorrow morning and go, today is the day that my taste buds fall in love with baked potatoes. I can't do it no matter how hard I try. I cannot do it. Until the day I die, my taste buds will always hate baked potatoes. They will always hate sweet potatoes for that matter. So if you invite me and my wonderful family to your house for dinner, I'm begging you, don't serve baked potatoes. I'll eat it because I'm polite and my mother taught me and I will make you think that I like it, but it's a lie. I will hate every bite, all right? So I can't, I mean, there are just things that I'm not free to choose. And when it comes to God supremely, we think that we're just simply free to choose what's good and avoid what's bad. That's a foreign notion to the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. I mean, when he says stuff like, uh, the things I want to do, I don't do. And things I don't want to do, those are the things I keep on doing. He, Paul never suffered from the delusion that he had a free will. I mean, the guy was on his way to Damascus, okay, on a pony or a horse, all right, with an with a entourage of people, you know, guys like the ones who stormed the stage on my behalf a few minutes ago, riding to Damascus. And what were they going to do? They were going to go and basically arrest and imprison every Christian there. And I mean, lo and behold, bam, God throws him off of his horse, blinds him, reveals himself to him and says, you're not persecuting them, you're persecuting me, and then resets Paul and sends him in a different direction. Paul never suffered from this delusion that he was capable of doing the good all by himself. In fact, the things, it's so funny because in Romans 7 when he says the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I, I shouldn't do, those are the things I keep on doing, that was him on the road to Damascus. He thought he was doing something good. He thought these Christian people were blaspheming God. He was a Pharisee. He thought that these people were blaspheming God by worshiping this imposter. And the best way he could glorify God was to eliminate the, was to eliminate the people who were following this imposter. God had to show up and show him something very, very different. So when we read something like 1 Corinthians 10, 31 and go, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, I can honestly say, honestly say, I haven't done that for one second in my life, not one. I mean, there is not one second in the 42 years that I've been alive that I can say from the inside and on the outside without any mixture of sin and complete perfection, I have in even a single moment glorified God with all that I am, which is why, which is why Instead of singing this morning, I surrender all, which I can't sing. And that's one of the reasons we don't sing it. So what do we do? Zach, the brilliant theologian that he is, becomes more biblical and changes the text to Christ surrendered all. Because I don't care who you are, none of us, we're sinners. I mean, we're sinners. None of us can say, I surrender all. Really? All? All? I mean, that was the posture of, um, that was the posture of the rich young ruler. I mean, the, and we're, we're just like him. We read that story, rich young ruler rides up to Jesus, tell me what I need to do to be saved, to inherit the kingdom. And Jesus basically walks his way through the Ten Commandments, and the rich young ruler goes, well, I mean, that's easy. It's child's play. I've been doing that since I was a kid. I mean, are you kidding me? We read that, and we go... What an arrogant jerk. And yet the disposition of our hearts is almost identical. Well, yeah, we're, we're, I mean, we're, we're pulling this off. You know, we're, we're getting it done. I mean, surely God sees all of my efforts and, and, you know, honors me for those things and blesses me for those things. And um, Jesus then hit him where it hurts and shows the extent of the law. And he said, okay, uh, just go sell everything you have. Everything. Everything you have. Don't keep one thing for yourself. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you can be my disciple. And what does it say? He went away sad because he knew he couldn't do that. So I surrender all? I surrender all? You ready and willing to completely and utterly surrender your children to God? 
What if God's plan for your child is that they end up in prison for the rest of their lives? You ready to surrender that? I mean, I surrender all? I surrender all of my fears? I will never ever again attempt to c- control my life by manipulating people and circumstances? I surrender all? I walk by faith infallibly? Of course we can't say that. You can't say that. I can't say that. I wish I could say I've kept all of my promises to God. I can't say that. You can't either. What I can say is that in Jesus, God has kept all of his promises to me. I wish I could say, you know, I, I glorify God in everything that I do. Everything I do, I do for the glory of God. I can't, neither can you. What I can say is that Jesus' blood covers all of my efforts to glorify myself. That's the gospel. Um, So while we break the first commandment before we even get out of bed in the morning, the promise we have in the gospel is that Jesus fulfills this commandment on our behalf. Think about Jesus' ministry for a moment. Jesus' ministry is bookended by events that actually show and illustrate his obedience to the first commandment. At the very beginning of his public ministry, before things really got started for him, after his baptism, what happened? He was led into the wilderness to be tempted and tried by the devil. And he goes into the desert to be tempted by Satan, and the basic summary of the three temptations that Satan throws at Jesus is, you can be God. Okay, now he failed to realize was God, and it's the same kind of thing that Satan said to Adam and Eve, which is the same kind of thing that he says to you and me each and every day. Why why be dependent when you can be independent? Why be reliant on someone else when you can rely on yourself? And yet Jesus, in all three temptations, humbled himself, submitted himself to the Father, keeping the first commandment, at every step along the way, having no other gods before God, keeping every, along the way, along every step of the way, keeping every jot and tittle of the law. Jesus, unlike us in the wilderness, remains humble. He refuses to exalt himself. And then at the end of his ministry, remember, he finds himself on trial before Pilate and Herod, and he has an opportunity to like, you know, just call angels down from heaven and just obliterate people. He has an opportunity to give his manifesto, but he remains silent, humbling himself yet again in the garden of Gethsemane, the night that he was betrayed and arrested, praying to the Father, if there's any other way, any other way, I mean, if there's any other way for you to pull this off, I'm asking you now, can you do it? And then how does he end his prayer? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. At every step along the way in Jesus' life, he fulfilled this first commandment. Because you and I fail at keeping this first commandment. He did that for you. He did that for sinners. Sinners like, sinners like me, you see, While Adam's sin was a reaching up, a trying to be God, Jesus' righteousness consisted of humbling himself, and as Paul says in Philippians 2, humbling himself even to death on a cross. Look at Philippians 2 real quick. Philippians chapter 2, this may be the best place in all the Bible to go to see Jesus fulfilling this first commandment for us. Beginning in verse 5. Four, three, start in verse three. (laughs) Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now look at what he says. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Who did he do that for? I mean, that is an explicit keeping of the first commandment. Who did he do that for? 
He kept that commandment for you, for me, for broken, sinful people like us who are incapable of keeping that commandment. For one second, you see, we put ourselves where only God deserves to be. God puts himself where only we deserve to be. That's the gospel. Sin is us substituting ourselves for God. Salvation is God substituting himself for us. I knew it. I knew it, Victor. We weren't going to last an entire service. Let me just close with this. My friend Justin Buzzard wrote this a while back in a post that he entitled Sweatshop Religion. And he said this. He said, the gospel of grace is the end of all sweatshop religion. We are saved by Jesus' sweat and blood, not our own. I think the existence of sweatshop religion can only be attributed to Satan, the enemy of God, and grace. Somehow Satan has so deceived the world that most people confuse Christianity with a sweatshop, sweating and laboring in cramped, loveless conditions in order to make a buck. Hear the gospel, and you discover that Christianity is actually the announcement that the sweatshop is closed. God has fixed our greatest problem for us. Jesus did the labor that we could never do, performing perfectly for God. And along with his perfect life, his perfect performance, Jesus received the punishment we all deserve. Instead of pridefully trying to make up for our very imperfect lives in the sweatshop, we are free to exit the building. So listen closely, and you'll hear the announcement made from Calvary 2,000 years ago. It is finished. The sweatshop is closed.